Liberty in our lifetimes in a free state of our own. That's the vision. That's the dream. And we are building it in New Hampshire. I'm Eric Brakey, your host and renegade statesman for the Porcupine Report. Welcome to your source for Porcupine news and free-range conversation on matters of liberty. All right, let's hop into the show. Hello and welcome, everyone. It's so great to see you here today. Of course, I can't actually see you, but you can see me uh, if you're watching the video version of the podcast. If you're let's just listening to the audio podcast, well, glad to hear have you here all the same. I am Eric Brakey, your host and renegade statesman, executive director of the Free State Project, and this is episode three of the Porcupine Report. Uh, thank you so much for coming with us on this journey every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. And you can always find every new episode streaming on the uh, Free State Project pages for uh, x.com, formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, uh, uh, Spotify, uh, YouTube, all your favorite podcasting apps. And of course, if you're listening on one of those podcasting apps, it always is very nice and very helpful if you go and subscribe. Make sure you're getting this on your regular listening app regularly. And if you want to leave a nice review, let people know that you like the show. It's brand new and uh, we're building our audience. So it's very much appreciated. Today on the Porcupine Report, we're going to be having a great conversation with uh, Jason Sorens, the founder of the Free State Project, in a moment. But before we get to that, I want to, uh, well, I want to tell you about, I know I tell you about it every week, but it's so important. It's going to be a great event, and I really hope you're going to join us there. It's the New Hampshire Liberty Forum, which is taking place Friday, March 15th to Sunday, March 17th. Uh, you know, the New Hampshire Liberty Forum is such a unique, wonderful event, I, you know, the New Hampshire Liberty Forum, every time I go, I learn about something that is just about to go big, right? I, You know, because, of course, when it comes to liberty, New Hampshire is the cradle of innovation for the liberty movement. You know, my first Liberty Forum about a decade ago, I went, and that's where I first learned about Bitcoin. We talked about that in the last episode. Uh, another time I went, I learned about amazing school choice things that were were happening, uh, which now, as New Hampshire leads the school choice revolution in America, and so many of these ideas are spreading across the country, I learned about it here first at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum. And uh, this year, we're going to have a great conversation on so many topics, including one of my, my personal favorites close to my heart, which is Defend the Guard. We're going to have a great conversation about Defend the Guard because, of course, New Hampshire the New Hampshire House of Representatives is the second legislative body in America to pass Defend the Guard. And we're going to be talking all about it at the New Hampshire Liberty Forum. But of course, that's not all. We're going to have so many great speakers. We're particularly excited about our two keynote speakers. On Friday night, we're going to have a, pro a professor and economist at George Mason University, Brian Kaplan, for our VIP dinner. And for our Saturday night keynote VIP dinner, we're going to have the one and only Glenn Jacobs, mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, and the WWE superstar known as Kane. You're not going to want to miss it. Get your tickets at nhlibertyforum.com before prices go up on March 1st. So get your tickets now. Prices will be going up. So don't wait. All right. Enough on Liberty Forum for now, though I'm never quite done because <laughs> I really do hope you will join us. Um, all right. So let's get in. We're just going to jump right into the conversation for this <coughs> evening. Um, we are going to be joined by Jason Sorens, who, as I mentioned, is the founder of the Free State Project, the organization that I work for. He is also an economist with the American Institute for Economic Research. And if you look up the enemies list of Granite State <coughs> Matters, which we discussed, um, you know, on the last episode, uh, they, they have uh, Jason Sorens listed there on the Granite State Matters enemy list as someone who is apparently rolling in Coke money. And by Coke money, I don't mean the Colombian kind. I mean the Wichita kind. 
But apparently, we'll have to ask him if that's actually true. I've been accused so many times of being funded by all this Coke money, and I wish for all the accusations that I had that I was Coke funded that I actually had a check to go with it. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm still waiting, Cokes. I'm waiting for that for that check to come in. Uh, we are always, you are always welcome to send a nice big check to the Free State Project to uh, help us um, uh, develop a homeland for liberty. But I kind of imagine I'm going to be waiting for a long time. Anyway, welcome to the show, Jason Sorens. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Well, all right. So I got to ask you, are you actually rolling in Coke money or is this just another invention of Granite State Matters? Yeah, I, I don't think AIR gets any um, any Coke money right now, but I uh, I did I did used to get some some grants from Coke affiliated organizations from time to time, which I was I was very pleased to get. Um, but uh, but unfortunately, that I'm not uh, I'm not rolling in it right now. So, no. all right. Well, <laughs> well, well. Anyway, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate you joining us. There's a lot to talk about, but um, I mean, I guess we could just hop right into it and we'll see where the conversation goes. Like you founded the Free State Project. We're 22 years into this experiment. Uh, it's been, I mean, from what I can tell, I haven't even moved to New Hampshire yet, of course. Uh, I'm in process, as you know, of moving, but I've started as the executive director. Uh, but you've, this has been your your baby for 22 years uh, you, I think you wrote a paper about it as a theoretical concept. What if all of these libertarians pick one state to land in and concentrate in and what kind of effect could that have? And 22 years down the road, here it is. Thousands of people have moved to New Hampshire. Um, and, uh, according to, uh, freedom in the 50 States, which is a report you had some, uh, some part in, you know, New Hampshire is ranked the freest state in America. So there's a lot happening. So let's, so let's just go back to the beginning. How did it all begin? Yeah, it started, uh, I was 24 years old in graduate school and uh, was working on a dissertation on secessionist movements around the world. Um, and uh, so these are, you know, these are movements for regional autonomy or independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was shortly after the 2000 presidential election that I became very disheartened at the state of U.S. national politics. Um, you know, in the 90s, there was a time when people thought there was a kind of libertarian moment. It was the first libertarian <laughs> moment <laughs> since 1776 or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. But <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the Internet, um, cryptography, globalization, the fall of communism, there is a sense that individual liberty was being unleashed around the world and that maybe governments would kind of wither away or something like that. And, yeah, well, and some people were really alarmed at that possibility. Yeah. But unfortunately, it, it became... The wall had just fallen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it was pretty clear by 2000, 2001 that that's not the way things are go going to happen. Um, the U.S. moved pretty strongly toward Bush-style republicanism. And this was even before 9-11, it was pretty clear that um, that the space for libertarian ideas at the on the national stage in D.C. Uh, was was very small. So um, so I was looking for alternatives and considered a number of different ideas, but I kind of put two and two together because of this work I was doing on movements for regional autonomy and independence overseas. I saw that um, you know one of the things I found was that most countries are decentralizing. They're giving more power to their regional governments. Um, Spain, Belgium, the United Kingdom, Italy, these are examples of countries that have been doing this. In the U.S., we've gone in the opposite direction for some time, certainly since at least the 1930s, uh, with the federal government growing at the expense of states. But it occurred to me that, why don't we, you know, we could use our federal system. Why don't we use our federal system uh, find a state that is already fairly friendly to liberty ideas, get liberty-friendly people to move there, uh, make a difference, and then start to grow the state's autonomy and, and get powers decentralized from the federal government. And, you know, I, I, at first I wondered whether this would be possible, whether we could get um, enough people to make a difference. And I did some, ran some early numbers, did some kind of basic... Uh, political science kind of, you know, um, back of the envelope calculations. And it looked really clear that actually, so long as these people were somewhat active, that they would have an outsized effect on the political process. So 
they wouldn't just be voting. Presumably, they'd also be giving money. They'd be, you know, educating their neighbors. They'd be even running for office themselves or supporting other candidates, writing legislation, testifying about legislation, all those sorts of things that now free staters, in fact, are doing. And so I proposed this idea um, in a, an article for the online journal, uh, online magazine, The Libertarian Enterprise. Um, and it was uh, published by L. Neil Smith back in the day <clears throat> and proposed this idea. And uh, I, I knew I might be onto something when the the editor said, hey, can I sign up? <laughs> and then uh, within the first two weeks after the article came out, about 200 people emailed me saying that they wanted to participate. Um, so we got together, set up a Yahoo club, uh, which was a thing back then. It's kind of like a web discussion uh, yeah. group and uh, hammered out all the details, set up a website, got together a statement of intent, um, got this idea that we would vote on the, on the state um, and start collecting signatures. And, you know, this I really intended to be entirely different from every other kind of libertarian new society, new country project that had happened before, of which there have been many such schemes, uh, <laughs> which um, often involved a lot of risk, a lot of expense, a lot of trust that you'd have to place in one leader, uh, which didn't seem quite the libertarian way, um, and not a lot of objective research or analysis about what would actually work and where you should actually go. And so this was intended to solve all of that as a kind of grassroots bottom-up movement where we'd all have a say and um, and join together and, and have the um, sort of confidence that we wouldn't be alone if we move, right? That uh, thousands of other people would be coming with us and that would definitely allow us to have a huge impact uh, and create a freer society. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really interested in this moment where, right, you go from kind of an academic paper, right? A, you know, a, a very intriguing idea that you kind of write down and publish as an article. Um, but a lot of people like write intriguing ideas, academic ideas. I mean, there are a whole, you know, I can think of all the, all these think tanks that are out there that just churn out like interesting ideas that just go sit and nothing ever happens with them. Um, so I'm really interested in that moment where it goes from being a, an interesting novel idea to um, to people actually saying, wow, let's actually let's actually do this. So when you so you, you talk about how uh, you published it, people started reaching out to you interested in you kind of organize these things. When you published that paper, were you thinking that this was going to be like actually something that you end up doing or were you publishing thinking it? Here's a really interesting, like, theoretical concept. Like, what do people think about it? Yeah, I mean, I wrote it as a call to action. I wanted this to yeah. happen. Like, I, 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 yeah, the idea seemed really exciting. Um, you know, I, I was a, you know, red-blooded young guy, impatient with <laughs> the progress <laughs> of, of politics in this country. And I thought, you know, this, this could really work. And maybe I conveyed that enthusiasm in the piece itself. And I think a lot of people got excited because it gave them hope. I think on some level, libertarians have always known that DC is hopeless. Yeah. Um, and so we need to we need to leverage what we can, um, which is one state. So what was that process for for picking the state of New Hampshire? I know over the last decade, I, I sometimes wish that I had... Um, been clued into this a little bit more when it happened. Maybe I would have lobbied for Maine now and uh, <laughs> and we'd all be in Maine. But instead, we're in New Hampshire and I'm excited to be moving to New Hampshire, even though I love Maine. Um, I just th this ex this experiment needs to succeed somewhere. What was that mm -hmm. process? Um, obviously, we know the end result that New Hampshire was was um, was the pick. Um, how did you guys arrive at New Hampshire as the pick for the Free State Project? What were some other states that were up for consideration um and um was there was there ever any um uh, yeah well is there is yeah. there like a parallel uh is there a parallel dimension in the multiverse where the free state project is in i don't know <laughs> alaska yeah maybe um we we agreed that the first five thousand people who signed up um, would be able to vote on the state and you were allowed to opt out of states that you weren't willing to move to. Uh, and we allowed people to rank 
all the ultimately it was 10 states, 10 candidate states. And instead of instead of what um, the, the the ranked choice voting that's popular now, we did something the more sophisticated called the Condorcet method, which is basically you use those rankings and you pick the alternative that beats every all alternative by a majority. Um, and actually ranked choice voting as used now doesn't guarantee that that's going to happen. Hmm. So New Hampshire won that vote very clearly on the second place state was Wyoming and uh, Wyoming, uh, New Hampshire defeated Wyoming something like 57 to 43 percent. Um, but as you might imagine, there was a huge discussion and set of controversies about the state selection. Um, you had people who had very strong views on this. We put together a selection committee to narrow it down to 10 states. And they did this basically by eliminating states that were clearly worse than other states, right? So if they were clearly too big or, you know, clearly, um, you know, way too statist compared to a state of the same size, right? Then it was mm. clearly sort of dominated by our criteria and we could, we could eliminate that. And so, so we ended like, up with 10 states. So like no, no Delaware, right? Delaware was on the, Delaware was oh, on the really? list. It's, yeah. So you, remember back in the, back in the nineties, Delaware for a moment there, seemed like a high economic freedom state. It was already trending democratic, but it wasn't too long since Pete DuPont was uh, was governor and he had run kind of a libertarian candidacy for the GOP presidential nomination mm -hmm. briefly in 1988. Um, and Delaware was scored really highly on these economic freedom and he's often number one. Um, so Delaware was in the mix. Uh, it didn't end up doing that well. It was only, the only warm weather state, too, and that attracted some people. <laughs> um, but Maine was in there, New Hampshire, Vermont, um, North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Alaska. And I think mm -hmm. I think that's it. Um, and, you know, all of those had interesting things about them. Um but uh, but New Hampshire was the only state where the governor actually supported us and lobbied us to choose the state. So that was that was a big signal. And I think that was one of the reasons uh, New Hampshire carried the day. Now, what what was it for the governor at the time that. Um, what was it about the governor? What was it about the Free State yeah. Project that you got a, a governor who was saying, you know, pick New Hampshire, come here? What what, what did he see in terms of value? For, of the Free State Project for the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, it was Craig Benson. He was definitely libertarian sympathetic. Uh, he was a Republican. He appointed um, his Libertarian Party opponent in the previous election to uh, an important state role, um, mm -hmm. John Babiars, who's still around. Uh, so um, I think, you know, he just thought, hey, this is a way to get more liberty-loving people to my state. And keep make a difference free. in the long run. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep New Hampshire free. You know, this was an inflection point in New Hampshire history because it's recently, um, shortly after the um, sort of infamous Claremont decisions uh, at the state Supreme Court level that mandated uh, new state spending on public education and kind of redistributing from um, high property tax base to low property tax base towns. And um, there was a real chance that New Hampshire could get an income or sales tax. Mm. And that did go down in the legislatures, I think, in 2001, 2000 or 2001 was the was the big vote where the rubber met the road. And instead, they kind of increased several other taxes, mostly relied on the, the statewide, a new statewide property tax. Um, but there's a real concern that. Uh, New Hampshire could go down the route of the rest of, of New England. And New Hampshire had been getting kind of bluer over time. And so it was, it was an inflection point. And I think what you notice since then is New Hampshire's gotten a little bit redder since uh, the Free State Project chose New Hampshire. I don't know if that's because of us. Um, you know, actually, the first Free Stater was elected. The legislature was elected as a Democrat. So there are um fsp democrats out there there's a minority uh, there are a few i know state i democrat I, I know i met a guy at porcupine day uh just yeah. recently who was telling me he was elected as a democrat that lasted i think he said it lasted for about uh <laughs> about one term Session. where the, the yeah, rest of the term. democrats were on to him <laughs> yeah and that's the thing like that the democrats did not want to have 
yeah. uh, libertarians getting elected under their their banner. And so they pulled out all the stops to oppose these people in primaries. Yeah. Um, so so it's become free series have over time gravitated much more toward the Republican Party where they've had a lot of success. Um, so so that makes sense. So it I think what you've seen is New Hampshire is certainly just objectively speaking, gained a, a lot of freedom since the FSP chose New Hampshire. Um, but also kind of helped uh, sort of stabilize the state electorally, it seems like. Yeah. So it's been, so 20 years. So, okay, so we've gone from, you know, the, the idea is conceived. There's the call to action. People are uh, organizing on Yahoo chat groups. And the first 5,000 people were signing up, get to, you know, pick the state new hampshire is picked as a state what what how how far into kind of the project like how many years from the publish of the paper to new hampshire being picked as the state uh less than two years it was less 2003 than... um so, when uh, yeah so so you got from in the span of two years you got to um had five thousand people signed signed up al yeah. already in two years Okay. Yeah, it was a it was a huge thing. It was it was uh, covered in all the states we were considering. Like I was doing radio all the time, TV. Uh, when the state choice was announced, we were on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, oh wow! We we made a we made a big error, which is that um, we then said, okay, now we got to get to twenty thousand before people start moving. Well, we should have <laughs> we should have had those numbers <laughs> much closer together, <laughs> because all of a sudden. Once we chose New Hampshire, we were no longer a national story. We were a New ah. Hampshire story getting covered in New Hampshire papers or maybe the Boston Globe. And uh, and we went through some serious doldrums. Like, first yeah. of all, we had to remove the people who'd opted out of New Hampshire. And, and New Hampshire didn't have an abnormal, abnormally large number of people who'd opted out of New Hampshire, but there were, a few, there were maybe a thousand. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then try to try to build up our base and. It was very difficult. Um, you know, we had we had pork fest back in, in in that period. It started in 2004, the first year after uh, New Hampshire was chosen, and uh, it was a good recruitment tool, good marketing tool, getting people to move to the state. But it was still very small. Like th these were the days when 150 people would show up to pork fest, and now it's 3,000. <laughs> right, it's gone 20x. It's um, um, so, year. yeah, and what really um, got our momentum back was the first Ron Paul presidential campaign. So tell me about that. Um, so you're in this period. Uh, you said New Hampshire is chosen in 2003. You have the mm -hmm. first pork fest in 2004. Uh, you said for this period is kind of the, the doldrums, kind of the momentum slows down. You're wondering if this is going to peter out. Uh, but then but then the Ron Paul revolution happens. So what, yeah. what, uh, I mean, I've got my feelings about the Ron Paul revolution, <laughs> but tell me specifically, like, what did that mean for the free state project? Yeah. I mean, it was hugely exciting, I think for libertarians around the U S uh, to have Ron Paul running as an alternative to McCain and the Bush dynasty and everything that the Republican party had stood for over the previous eight years. Um, people were, going to lay it on the line for him. Like the, the money bombs were huge. Like he had a fanatical fan base and it was, uh, it was understandable. We had uh, Ron Paul come and speak at the 2007 uh, New Hampshire Liberty Forum. It was the very first New Hampshire Liberty Forum it was 2007. We had Ron Paul and John Stossel. And uh, <laughs> so good, good lineup. I was yeah. kind of hoping that, that Ron Paul would announce his presidential campaign at that event. He did not. Um, but a few months later, he, he announced he was in the race. And then the 2008 Liberty Forum was a complete zoo. And there's some Liberty, uh, there's some um, YouTube videos out there uh, because Liberty Forum was held in the thick of the presidential primary campaign in January 2008. And so you had hundreds of, um, you know, young Ron Paul revolution college students converging yeah. on new hampshire you know 
people mobbing the CNN boss, you know, and chanting in the streets and all, you know, um, who knows what good it did electorally. I mean, you got 8% of that primary in, in New yeah. Hampshire, which is still... I do yeah. seem to remember uh, Sean Hannity in New Hampshire getting a snowball thrown at him. That seemed very much deserved. <laughs> uh, and what, I think when they excluded yeah. Ron Paul from like the New Hampshire debate that year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, Ron Paul did really well, actually, in New Hampshire. He got his highest uh, percentage of the electorate uh, was in was in New Hampshire in both 2008 and 2012. Um, you know, we have a very, very high turnout presidential primary, the highest turnout primary in the country every four years. Um, so that, you know, when you have and when you have lots of candidates who are still in the race, right, it splits the vote more so wasn't quite his highest raw percentage, but if you look at it in terms of the electorate, it's his highest. So it was, it was very good, um, but not not uh, close to where he would um, get in 2012, which was 23%. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the I, infamous I, Ron Paul's freaking giant uh, election. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember, because of course I, I um, uh, of course, I was working on the Ron Paul campaign in Maine in 2012. I remember coming over to an event in New Hampshire Ron Paul was speaking at and and getting a nice photo with him that I still have. Um, but um, I remember like reading, you know, this is back in the days, like every day I would Google Ron Paul to see what the new news story was. And I just remember like going into the as the New Hampshire primary approaching, like people are referring to like the Free State Project as Ron Paul's secret weapon in New Hampshire. It's like literally yeah. the first primary in the nation. It's like there's a literal movement of libertarians to move to New Hampshire. And I'm sure that that did have a, a big impact on Ron's strong second place finish there. Um, yeah. Um, and of course I remember, oh, yeah. yeah. And I remember that year was my first pork fest. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah. But it was, it, so I, I, I never was at pork fest when it was 150 people. I remember it being pretty yeah. strong turnout in 2012 <laughs> in the height of the yeah. Ron Paul moment. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of those, uh, college students who came, uh, and, and young people who came to, to work on his campaign or volunteer just stayed um yeah and some of them are, are still here and uh and that's when when pork fast also really started to take off it, it became a very young crowd um you know right around that that kind of time period 2011 2012 uh for sure and i did some statistical analysis and found that um i had access to the fsp participant database and i found that for every um additional FSP participant in a town. Uh, this was in 2008, actually. I, so I, did, um, I don't know about 2012, might be, even be a bigger number, but for every additional um, FSP participant in a town, um, there were two additional votes for Ron Paul. And it was statistically significant. So it seemed, sure seemed like um, not only were free staters themselves voting for Ron Paul, but they were on average getting at least one neighbor to do the same. Mm -hmm um just in their own town right and that uh, kind of i think understates the impact of the fsp but because yeah. of course a lot of the things that you're doing are going to have effects outside your town let's just say yeah. like looking even just at, at your neighbors um there was a there was a noticeable statistically discernible effect yeah well liberty is a contagious idea so yeah we'll bring a lot of inf people to new hampshire infected with liberty and we'll spread it around um <laughs> so um so that takes us up through, so that's about a decade into the Free State Project, right? So yeah. um, uh, 2001 to 2012, it's a little bit longer than a decade. Um, um, that still leaves a decade to go. Uh, until yeah. we, <laughs> we have a little bit more than a decade until we get to today. Yeah. So what was the second, what, what's, um, yeah. obviously the Ron Paul campaign finishes. I think there was a lot of, I think in the liberty movement, there was a lot of optimism for, um, you know, the liberty movement in general. People were excited about Rand Paul looking like he was going to run in 2016. I know I was very excited. Mm -hmm. That campaign didn't really end up um, channeling the yeah. the Ron Paul revolution the way many had hoped. Um, but for the Free State Project, I mean, I'm always amazed when I have come to New Hampshire and kind of see it's like the Ron Paul campaign never ended all these events still going on. I mean, what's, yeah. um, tell me about this last decade. Yeah. 
So um, really, there's another watershed event, which is the, the 2010 wave election. Yeah. In 2006, the first free state project mover was elected to the state house as a Democrat, as I mentioned. And then in 2008, three were elected. And then in 2010, 11 were elected. And hmm. the state house ended up being roughly three quarters Republican. <laughs> and the state Senate was like five sixths Republican. Oh, it was yeah. Still a Democratic governor, actually, but um, uh, a mo- kind of a moderate Democrat. And so it um, that legislature enacted a number of reforms uh, that are still with us today. And that was really what kickstarted the kind of modern day free market revolution in New Hampshire. Um, abolished, for example, the certificate of need law for hospital construction. I think oh, we're wow. still the only, yeah. We, I, we've been trying in Maine for years <laughs> to get rid of that damn thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm literally uh, beating my head against like my committee desk every single year, like trying to uh, get Democrats in uh, to agree to that. But yeah. Okay. Go on. I'm a little jealous. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of, one of these things that um, experts have, have long recommended, but special interests oppose, and, and we managed to get it done. Uh, we cut the budget by 12% in just nominal dollars not as like inflation adjusted or percent of GDP or so, whatever, so, but it's like 12% less dollars. <laughs> so, so it's not like a Washington DC spending cut. Like we yeah. were planning to grow government by 20% right. and instead we're going to only grow up by 10%. So we're cutting the, but so that means we're cutting the right. budget by 10%, even though we're spending more next year than this year. So like a real cut, like yeah, government spending went backward. Yeah. Government spending went backward in a, in a big way. Um, the statewide property tax was cut. Um, other taxes were cut. Uh, I believe, I'm trying to remember, I don't think I don't think we got constitutional carry yet. Um, but we got yeah, Maine um, got it first. That's one thing. Yeah, Maine got yeah yeah. It's one thing I sure. can brag about. Yeah, I want to say we got it in like 2017 or something. Yeah, you guys um, did get a cleaner version than we did, so maybe good things come to those who wait. Yeah. So it was it was a it was a really striking change, and I think that since then um, there's been a strong libertarian caucus in the legislature. And here you've got to include people who are not just free state project movers. There are a lot of natives here who yeah. are liberty leaning. Of course, the live free or die state has always had that libertarian streak, um, and you know they 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 probably outnumber the free state project movers who are in the in the legislature um you know 20 uh 2012 election was kind of um maybe even maybe even a slight step down um in terms of um how many get elected then 2014 was another great year another great midterm year um we got we gradually expanded school choice um and a number of things some of these we don't even um talk about maybe as much as we should so obviously we have the education freedom accounts now which um where the the money follows a child right um state yep. state adequacy dollars new right? gold as a standard of school choice yeah you can use it for homeschool private school educational expenses um but in addition to that we have something co- that was for a while called the croydon bill any town that lacks a public school for a certain grade I uh, can adopt full school choice. Uh, hmm. And that's much bigger than EFAs in terms of the dollar amount. So you've got the town of Croydon where um, a bunch of their kids now go to the Newport Montessori school um, where they're paying only something like eight to $10,000 per kid, uh, which is like half what a public school education would cost. Um, so there's a there's actually a built-in incentive there for towns to privatize their public schools and then allow parents full school choice, right? <laughs> the, the state law is there to let you do that. Wow. So that yeah. sounds like a win-win for everyone except for the teachers' unions, right? So it's like sure. for the property taxpayers, it costs less. For the parents, they get to send their kids wherever they want. So you can't ask for better than that, right? Uh, yeah. So a lot of communities uh, take advantage of that in New Hampshire? 
Well, only Croy only Croydon has 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 a new program since that bill has passed. There were okay. a few kind of grandfathered towns that were um, border towns, um, just like Maine and Vermont. New Hampshire had a policy where border towns were allowed to adopt some form of school choice um, if they didn't have a public school grade. Yeah. Um, so there are some towns that that have always had that. Um, Croydon's the only kind of new town that's adopted that. So I, I you know, I, again, I don't think this is talked about enough. This is something that we should start encouraging in, in communities because it's a, you know, a big win-win. And you know, when when we were looking for a home, I noticed searching for houses in Croydon, they always mention it, the possibility mm. of school choice, right? It's a so it it's a boost to property values as well. Because yeah. it makes your your home more marketable. Hmm. I'm I'm certain that a lot of families would be seeking that out, and I know yeah. I, I had always thought it was. Uh, um, I remember at Liberty Forum one year learning about I know uh, these um, I guess the school choice policy that had been enacted in New Hampshire years back. It was Kate is a Kate Kate Baker. Who's, yeah, get her name right. She been kind of pushing school choice here in new hampshire for a long time but I remember her talking about like educational scholarship funds right where people can yeah. uh you can is it like a bit businesses or individuals you can donate to a 501c3 educational scholarship fund and that's right that yeah that was the very first thing we got is that tax yeah. credit scholarship so it's a tax credit for businesses so it's really a big strong tax advantage 85% of your donation, you, you take off your actual business tax. So, um, so we, we got that and that supplements EFAs. So we've, we've yeah. got several forms of school choice now um, that have been big. And we've also deregulated homeschool uh, laws. Um, that, that was a, a big thing that happened uh, over the last 15 years. Um, you know, we got marijuana decriminalization. We legalized medical marijuana. Haven't yet legalized recreational. <laughs> Everyone knows that that's coming. It will happen sooner yeah, or later. Yeah. Well, I know uh, New, New, New Hampshire doesn't yeah. have a a, a, ref, a referendum process, which is what we. That's right. <laughs> which yes. is uh, how you legalized reefer in Maine, right? It's a double edged sword, right? Referendums, right. Uh, I find in Maine, in Maine, we have a referendum process. You could legalize cannabis that way, but you also get a lot of really bad policy that way, too. Like, uh, I agree. You know, I think we're better off without it. Uh, if you look at states that have that ballot initiative, um, even, you know, some deep, deeper red states like Arizona, South Dakota, um, they get, you know, high minimum wages, they get really strict smoking bans, things like that, that appeal to the median voter who's not very well informed. Yeah, uh, you know, kind of populist legislation is easy to pass. So I, I think we're better off um you know with without it and sometimes that means new hampshire does things more slowly than other states yeah i've noticed this so we're we're not usually the f very first to adopt a policy but almost all good policies get adopted here eventually <laughs> you know, all the, all these good policy innovations like universal licensure reciprocity is another one that that we've adopted uh, i think last year um started in arizona but came here um, I'm sure we'll get to universal school choice. If not this year, there's going to be a, a big battle on the on the House floor. It may happen, um, but if not this year, then in a future year. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot a lot of the housing stuff, like zoning reform, um, a lot of that has has been uh, advancing in in New Hampshire, helping to you know free up the supply of housing and bring down costs. Um, and you know, now we've got probably um, a fifth of the state house is sort of committed libertarians basically you know um a rated new hampshire liberty alliance reps uh and we've got a couple uh one or two depending on how how broadly you define it in the state senate which is only 24 reps so that's still a, yeah. a decent number um so uh so yeah we, we've been making a big difference and we're at a point now where we swing the vote on a lot of things yeah um, you know, there are certain policies that neither Democrats nor Republicans can can get over the line because it's just too strong a yeah. uh, libertarian caucus there. Well, I mean, it is interesting to see. Right. Yeah, and you say, you know, like a fifth of the New Hampshire House. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think it goes to show like the the overall impact of just kind of shifting the narratives within these institutions that you have something like defend the guard 
that passes the New Hampshire House with a bipartisan majority recently. And I know that, um, you know, one of the two candidates for governor uh, in the Republican primary, of course, 501c3 nonprofit organization, we're not endorsing or promoting any candidates whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But it is very interesting to see that, um, uh, you know, Chuck Morse, former Senate president, um, is has specifically and very wholeheartedly, apparently, come out and supported Defend the Guard. He published a whole op-ed, and he seems to be using it, I think, pretty effectively as a wedge issue against Kelly Ayotte, who I think people know from her history in the uh, in in um, uh, in the in Congress that she's pretty much a neocon on 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 foreign policy and and so it speaks to i don't know i i don't know chuck morris i'm actually supposed to sit down and meet with him sometime i'm looking forward to that but um i don't know how sincere it is or if it's just kind of political savvy but even if it's just mm -hmm. political savvy i mean it certainly speaks to wow here's a real pocket of swing voters uh that um that he must perceive to some degree like he wants to win this pocket of votes in the Republican primary. And so to take a position on something like defend the guard, which is very near and dear to the hearts of, mm -hmm. you know, Ron Paul libertarians. Um, I think it, it must say something to the, the, the political clout of the, of the free, of uh, the free state movement here in New Hampshire. It really does say something. Uh, and that's, that's a really good example of the phenomenon we find that politicians want to come and speak at Pork Fest. You know, the Free State Project as a uh, as a public charity, we can't be partisan, right? So, so we try to get people to New Hampshire, educate people about the benefits of living free in New Hampshire. Uh, but once you're here, you can do whatever you want. You can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, you can be an independent, you can be a Libertarian, you can um, work on legislation, or you can avoid politics. Some people avoid traditional politics and they get involved in education or agorism or things like that, which are, you know, there's a place for that too. Um, so, um, so with that disclaimer, I'll say, you know, when we do um, have candidates come to our events, we, you know, we, if they're active candidates. We invite all the candidates for that office. Um, but like pork fest uh, this past year, Vivek came uh, and got a lot of was clearly trying to cultivate the libertarian vote. I mean, maybe these are things he he believes sincerely, but he, you know, said he would pardon Ross Ulbricht, um, yeah, pardon Edward Snowden. So, you know, this this is um, kind of an unlooked for benefit of the Free State Project, as we are the first in the nation primary state, and that puts us on the radar screen of federal politicians too. Um, maybe there's some, you know. We don't want to be too too much on the radar screen of the federal government, but I think I think it's good. I think it's good to have some kind of pull um, at that level so that we can be left alone to yeah. you know cultivate freedom here. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know. I was just over in, um, you know, I, I'm still finishing out my term in the main Senate, as you know, um, and I was sitting there um, in a committee meeting earlier today and. Um, you know, someone I know who's a lot, you know, lobbyist with kind of the, the state national guard comes over me. She asked me like, are you involved with that defend the guard effort in New Hampshire? <laughs> like, what do you, now she actually, she privately tells me that she actually supports the ID, even though her, her bosses, um, uh, you know, the adjutant generals and stuff don't, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but anyway, it, it's just interesting to see that, like what is happening in New Hampshire right? Yeah. The ripple effects. It's making the whole military industrial complex nervous. And I think it's, um, right. It's, I, I, I think one of the classic mistakes and I, it's an understandable mistake that I think has been made so often by so many in the Liberty movement is this idea that we need to start big, right? We mm -hmm. need to like, I'll meet someone who is like, they're excited. They're all about Liberty. And they're like the first thing they're going to do is they're going to run for the United States Senate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. And, or they're going to run for president. Yeah. Usually on their like the LP ticket or, you know, what have you. And it's like, you know, in New Hampshire, you can just run for state representative and you can get elected and yeah. you can be a part of this, um, uh, this, this, this wave that is doing things that aren't just going to make an impact in New Hampshire. I mean, obviously primarily that's where the impact is going to be, 
But when you're nullifying unconstitutional federal tyrannies, as a defend the guard would do, as so many other nullification efforts mm -hmm. uh, seek to do, whether it's around cannabis policy or Second Amendment rights or what have you, I mean, this is uh, if you really want to change things in Washington, D.C., even if you could get elected to the U.S. Senate, God knows I tried once. Right. Um, it, it's hard to change that swamp from the inside. But by taking yeah. the power away from them from the outside, by having state legislatures that are willing to assert their power and their sovereignty under the Constitution, you know, you can do a lot. And it's exciting to see New Hampshire leading the way uh, in that regard. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say the FSP is for people who are willing to put in the work, who have the patience uh, to celebrate every victory, take half a loaf, half a loaf, half a loaf, half a loaf relentlessly until the other side has only crumbs left. You know, that's <laughs> and then they give up and they, move, and they move to uh, and they move to Massachusetts where they. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, let's see. We are. Um, I want to be conscious of time. So we've got maybe five, five minutes left. Um, any kind of like final things like I think are worth addressing. I know we've gone through a whole history here from the, from the, the launch of the idea, the initial people getting excited about it, organizing, picking the state, the move here, the first pork fest, the first Liberty forum, the Ron Paul revolution, uh, folks getting elected to the state legislature. So many great policies that have been passed. Um, I guess let's just close. Like what's your favorite thing about New Hampshire? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, that's a, that's a tough one. Cause I, I love so much about it. I, I moved here in 2013 from Buffalo, New York. It took me a while because I was a professor. So it's, you yeah, know, you don't get to choose where you live, but I, I ended up jumping for a one year job at Dartmouth and <laughs> I've managed to make it work for the last decade. Um, and so you feel the freedom right away. You feel the the low taxes, um, you know the even the the signs at the border that say um, you know buckle up under eighteen common sense for all, you know <laughs> like it's, it's not click it or ticket because you know we're leaving it up to your choice if you're a consenting adult, you know uh, which I, is just as it should be. Yeah, you know I know uh, that's always been a pet peeve issue of mine. I know my, my actually my first year in the main Senate I put in a bill to repeal the seatbelt law for oh, adults. Wow. Right. Um, and, you know, I like seatbelts. I think it's a good idea to wear a seatbelt. Sure. I just don't like, you know, doing it with a gun pointed in my head. Right. And uh, you boy, you the, the line of lobbyists out the door for that for that <laughs> bill. And I remember people, uh, you know, mocking New Hampshire. It's like, oh, it really is the live free or die state because uh, <laughs> people aren't wearing their seatbelts. It's like, all right, well, whatever. But, I, I, you know, it's funny. I didn't realize that you had come from New York because it's interesting, of yeah. course, you know, the the study that um, that AIER published. Um, uh, or actually, we're Cato, through, Cato was, Institute published Cato it. Cato yeah. Institute published it, but you you had a, you had a, a hand in working on it. The freedom yeah. in the fifty states, right? New Hampshire is ranked number one for freedom, and I didn't realize you were you know from New York. I, I spent some time yeah. living in New York. New York is dead last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, so you went. For, so that was a major upgrade for you. You yeah. went from uh, the, the 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 least free state in America to the most free state in America really quickly. I know. I know. I said this was going to be the last thing. We got a few yeah. minutes left, but like. So what that freedom in the 50 states report, like what are the kinds of things that distinguish a New York from a New Hampshire? I mean, New York has high taxes across the board, high property tax, high sales tax, high income tax, everything. Um, New Hampshire has high property tax because it's a local tax uh, and that's where schools are funded. Um, it's very decentralized in New Hampshire, which I think is great. Um, we should bring property taxes down but it's a, it's a symptom of our decentralized system of government and we don't have sales or income taxes. So, um, so that right there, um, New York's tax burden is more than twice uh, New Hampshire's. Um, New Hampshire has, you know, more freedom to, to start a business, less occupational licensing, um, you know, better court system, like just better environment for business. Uh, it has more personal freedom, more gun, you know, more gun freedom. It's like basically the number one state in the country for, for gun freedom, uh, freedom of the 50 states is number two, Kansas beats us with one little tiny thing, but, uh, um, but you know, we could, we could actually debate that. 
And New York is one of the worst uh, for fi- for Second Amendment issues, firearms, freedom. So, um, you know, New Hampshire, very low crime rate, much lower than New York, um, despite despite yeah. <laughs> the the, uh, the, well, the lack out, of, of gun regulation. Turns out criminals don't obey the law. Go figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're you're gonna feel it right away in your in your pocketbook if nowhere else. But um, you know, school choice, homeschooling, and, you know, homeschooling laws in New York are terrible. Um, so I know yeah. families who move just for that reason alone. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely a big change. And guess what? The state is incredibly beautiful, <laughs> and <laughs> and it's a you know four season outdoor paradise. Yeah. Like, you know, there's skiing and snowshoeing and sledding and ice skating in the winter. Winter is actually the best season. Yeah. In my opinion. Um, and uh, snowmobiling and then, you know, just gorgeous summers and, and mountains and uh, wildlife and lakes and ocean. And you're close to Canada. You're close to everything, right? If yeah. you want a taste of the city, Boston's right there. Montreal is not far. Um, you know, New York City's not far if that's what you want. But um, nice to visit. So it, but it's yeah yeah right <laughs> would never live there um you know and i think i don't know i think i think we also benefit from being a a purple state as opposed to a deep red state because you know what happens in the deep red states is that democrats run as republicans yeah and you have a very strong kind of establishment hold on the party and i think that's the case in wyoming where it's been kind of a you know kind of a neoconish state kind of a, an establishment republican state they haven't reformed in the way that New Hampshire has, where we have that kind of critical mass of, of libertarians who can kind of, you know, block anything that's crazy from the, from the right and anything that's crazy from the left and also advance issues like defend the guard. Well, that's great. And, and so uh, to the audience, particularly the audience living in New York state, and you know who you are, <laughs> what are you doing? Come to New Hampshire. You, it's a major upgrade. We're not that far away. It's, it's just a couple hundred miles. You can literally like get a U-Haul tomorrow, come up to New Hampshire, and let us know because there will be people here, free staters here, ready to unpack that U-Haul for you and help you set up in your brand new home. And there are so many realtors here jumping over each other to try to sell you a home. <laughs> so go to fsp.org and find out how to move to New Hampshire. Um all you living in New York or any of the other tyrannical states. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to give you one final word. Then we're going to close up. I mean, that was, you gave us a, a great word, uh, fsp.org. You know, we've got thousands here uh, who are already in New Hampshire, 7,000 in our database with the New Hampshire address. So the lot, there's, there's so much going on. There's so many people to meet, a, a whole culture to plug into. Um, so it's really, it's really uh, a wonderful, life-changing experience. Awesome. That's Jason Sorens, everyone. Thank you, Jason, so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Before we close out for, for this episode three, we just had a great conversation on, on um, the history of the Free State Project. We talked about the first Liberty Forum. We talked about the first Porcupine Freedom Festival. And you know what? All of these events are still going on. In fact, Liberty Forum's coming up in March. I know you're coming because I told you you should go get a ticket. So if you haven't done that yet, literally, you can pause this video right now unless you're watching the live stream. But you, even if it's still going on, you can go to nhlibertyforum.com and get your ticket. But I want to close out with our other wonderful event coming up in June, the Porcupine Freedom Festival. This is a family-friendly freedom festival. In fact, I'm told that last year there were over 400, uh, there were over 400 kids in attendance, right? So people are bringing their families. It's it's a family-friendly freedom festival. It is the largest Liberty Festival in America. It's taking place June 17th through the 23rd at Rogers Campground in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Ron Paul will be joining us. Well, he's going to be joining us virtually, right? (laughs) He's going to be zooming in, but we're going to hear a great talk from him. But you know who is joining us in person? You can go camping with 2,000 of your favorite libertarians, including Scott Horton, Gene Epstein, Jeffrey Tucker, James Bovard, David Friedman, Matt and Terry Kibbe, and so many more. It is not to be missed. So grab your tickets at porkfest.com before they sell out. There are less than 300 tickets left at the almost early bird pricing. 
a level. So act now, bring your friends, bring your family, and reserve your campsite while supplies last. Space is very limited, so go to porkfest.com. And as I always remind you, it's pork with a C, not with a K. If you go to Porkfest with a K, you're going to end up getting some great barbecue, perhaps. But you won't be at the family-friendly freedom festival that you're looking for. So porkfest.com, pork with a C. All right. Thank you again to our technical producer, Justin O'Donnell, for running uh, everything behind the scenes as we record this episode tonight. And furthermore, my opinion is the Federal Reserve should be destroyed. Talk to you all next week.